This video is supported by Surfshark VPN. Hey hey Marcus, House with you here. Today we are talking about the explosive potential of a full Starship stack. Typically I don't like to stress anyone out with such questions and I'm sure that SpaceX is doing everything they possibly can to minimise any such issue from occurring in the first place. Thanks to SpaceX's iterative design, the chances of a catastrophic explosion is very low. All the static fires and flight tests leave us feeling confident in Starship's first orbital flight test at least clearing the tower. However, in an unlikely event of a rapid unscheduled disassembly on the pad, we were thinking about what the damage potential could be, and it isn't as easy to predict as you might think. This is a topic that I've wanted to explore for a while now, but the reason I've been hesitant is because it's quite difficult to really determine the explosive potential in real world situations. The major goals of Starship of course is to lower the cost of payload to space, carrying life support systems, orbital refilling, and finally deliveries and transport to the moon and in the future hopefully Mars. But before any of that can happen, we need to see the largest, most powerful and fully reusable rocket in the world successfully launch without taking out the entire launch facility with it. You might be surprised at some of the explosive numbers, so let's get started. Now, I don't want to jinx anything talking about this, but it's an interesting topic all the same. Blast security is something that SpaceX would indeed be considering very carefully right now. Sure, we've seen plenty of ships explode already without there being a great risk to the launch site. All that happened there though were minor repairs being needed after fairly minimal damage overall. And of course, a little debris rain. So we had explosions on site. on impact, the late boomer, and the mystery explosion. But what all of those had in common was a maximum methane load of maybe 10 tonnes or so. A fully filled stack will hold more than 1,000 tonnes of methane, nearly 100 times as much. So avoiding a rapid unscheduled disassembly should be the highest priority, otherwise things are going to get ugly. This is SpaceX's Falcon 9 being prepared for the launch with the Amos 6 mission in 2016. This mission certainly did not go to plan. The Falcon 9 here suddenly erupted during pre-flight testing and dropped the payload in this secondary explosion. A big setback for SpaceX at the time. Assuming it was fully filled here, the Falcon 9 contains around 160 tonnes of RP-1 as its fuel, only 16% of the fuel mass than the full Starship stack, and it combusted not all at once, but during two separate explosions and overall burning afterwards. And then we have the Proton in 2013 hit the ground here with nearly a third of its first stage's propellant burned, and the upper stages in flames due to the aerodynamically induced breakup. So something in the area of 120 tonnes of UDMH ignited at once when smashing into the ground. One of the biggest rocket explosions ever recorded was the N1 in 1969. The blast there destroyed the launch complex and hurled debris up to 10 kilometers around the impact point. There are stories of broken windows even 35 kilometers away, but of the possibly remaining 600 metric tons of RP-1, several scientists estimated after the accident that only 15% actually ignited at once. You need to remember that all of this is an estimate as well, as it's very hard to know solid numbers on this stuff. An interesting point is also that in this situation, the kerosene was at room temperature. The methane contained in the Starship is at minus 180 degrees Celsius. If this was dispersed into the warm air heated by a smaller explosion in, say, the downcomer, it could evaporate faster and have more explosive potential than RP-1, since gases mix much better. Already the N1 explosion was estimated to have the equivalent of one kiloton of TNT. But before we cover the possible TNT equivalent range of methane explosions, let's just get a short understanding of the TNT equivalent itself. Anais here built a little Excel tool to estimate the damage happening relative to the distance of the explosion. We've got that linked as a download in the description below if you want to take a closer look. You just type in the TNT equivalent and you get a sudden pressure change and respective damage types for different distances to the explosion. It is certainly true here that very close to the explosion, damage happens because of the extreme heat additionally to the pressure change, but generally the damage potential is measured by that change in pressure due to the colossal shockwave. 
The usual unit that we measure this in is millibar, and it doesn't sound like a great deal, does it? But one millibar is the equivalent of 100 pascals. One pascal is defined as one newton per square meter. So this all works out to be just a little over 10 kilograms per square meter. That is a reasonably substantial force for just that one millibar. One bar, of course, is 1,000 times that, and this is roughly the atmospheric pressure on Earth here at sea level. But wait, that's a force of about 10 tons or two monster trucks pressing against a typical one by one sized meter window. Last I checked, our windows here were all intact, so why is that? It's all due to the fact, of course, that there is the same pressure inside and outside. But if there is a sudden pressure change approaching from one side of the window, things get very messy very quickly. Just three millibar of sudden pressure change is the equivalent of about 140 decibels or 30 kilograms per square meter. So that's not only loud, that is painful. It's like a firework going off right next to your ear, which can deal serious damage to your eardrum. Usually, of course, sound is a stream of pressure changes, but a single loud bang is just one shockwave. In extreme cases, we can even see it. Here, we see a small military solid rocket stage destroyed in a controlled manner, and we can see the shockwave speeding towards the camera, resulting in a loud bang once it reached the microphone. It's really hard to know the decibels here, but given the movement on the ground and the camera shaking, we're likely hearing something well behind 140 decibels. We can also count about six seconds until the sound reaches the microphone as well. Multiplying this with the speed of sound at about 340 meters per second, the explosion is around two kilometers away at least. Those shockwaves tend to travel faster than the speed of sound closer to the detonation. Apparently around 17 tonnes of solid propellant was detonated here. If that's even half as explosive as TNT, say 8.5 tonnes worth, the camera should have experienced about 6 millibars of pressure change. This shouldn't damage windows, but the bang at this distance would be very painful and would result in complete destruction expanding out to a radius of about 50 metres or so. So yes, we just assumed this detonation was about half the strength of TNT, but is that correct? Well, precise estimation of the TNT equivalent is hard. We did some research and found a study for high pressure gas tanks. No solid propellant, but we're here to get an idea of a fully filled Starship stack exploding. These topics are always so interesting to me as we research them, and thanks to you watching, that allows us to present this information in a friendly way to everyone, so thank you very much for the support that you all show here. This study came to the conclusion that gaseous methane at 350 bar is roughly as explodey as the same amount of TNT with its high combustion efficiency. When comparing the energy content of methane to TNT, we see that methane holds more than 10 times as much energy. But energy content doesn't necessarily mean equal explosive potential. Detonation velocity is a major factor as well. It's the velocity of the shockwave traveling within the explosion itself. Mixed well with air, it's less than a fourth of TNT. Uneven mixture though will then reduce that potential even more. And this opens a fairly wide range of possibilities since methane can't burn in the center of a gas bubble when only the surface is in contact with oxygen. Therefore, in the case of gas tanks, when comparing the energy content, dividing the energy by 10 to 100 gives you the proper ballpark figure. So this means about 1,000 tons of liquid methane that will end up in a fully fueled stack is comparable somewhere between 100 to 1,000 tons of TNT. But that's pretty weird, right? The N1 explosion was estimated to be comparable to 1,000 tons of TNT as well, while only a sixth of the 600 tons of RP-1 actually exploded. Well, allegedly at least. The energy content of RP-1 is around 82% that of methane as well. Fairly comparable. So how can this be? Well, the tool here also shows us that the damage radius just increases by a factor of 2.2 when the TNT equivalent increases by a factor of 10. This is due to the logarithmic nature of shockwave propagation. That is why slight errors in measuring the pressure change will lead to large errors in the estimate. That means that the N1 explosion estimate comes with a wide margin of error. But even this might not explain everything. It's all very confusing, of course, and we'll explain that more in just a moment. But before that, a big thanks to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video.
A VPN or virtual private network gives you the ability to unlock the internet and grant you access to content that has been blocked from your location. As an example, if you're trying to stream a video that is not available from within your country, you can just change the country that you're accessing the internet from, and that is it. You just refresh your browser and you will now appear to be located in the select region. That content and much more is now available to load. One of the most useful features is being able to protect your privacy from those around you. In many cases, local network logs within your environment are recording your online behavior. Maybe within those networks, you've also been restricted from social platforms and external news services. That is no longer a problem with Surfshark VPN. With the included tools, you can protect yourself from data mining services using your search history to advertise to you. What is also great is that you can connect all of your family devices simultaneously with a single account. If you'd like to support my channel here and are considering a new VPN or changing your existing VPN, go to surfshark.deals Marcus and you'll get 83% off and three extra months for free. The link is in the description below. Okay, so I think we can clear up some of the potential numbers here a little more. The solution might be in the fact that pure methane in a gas tank reacts only with air, which is mostly nitrogen. It also explodes not by ignition, but by overpressure, which means dispersion of the methane before actual ignition itself. In ideal settings, when mixed very well with pure oxygen, the detonation velocity of methane is about close to a third of that of TNT. That might increase combustion efficiency by an order of magnitude, and that possibly also explains the N1 explosion. Luckily, we have another interesting example as well. An Antares rocket exploded in 2014 quite close to the pad here. This setback was quite costly with around 15 million US dollars in damage. No one got injured, of course, given the typical evacuation procedures with such a launch, but just look at these stunning colors of the mushroom cloud here. Having burned through just a few seconds worth of propellant, most of the 70 tons of RP-1 and the solid rocket fuel in the upper stage were likely burned in and around the explosion. An assessment that we found on this event estimated the larger blast to be equivalent to 200 tons of TNT. This is nearly double the amount per tonne of fuel compared to the N1 estimate. Okay, so now we have more data to work with, allowing us to combine assumptions on the available oxygen, the results of the N1 and the Antares explosions, and the earlier vaporization of methane compared to RP1 due to the much lower boiling point at negative 162 degrees Celsius. RP1 in comparison is liquid at room temperature. Elon Musk himself doesn't seem to be all that worried. He said here that it would be more of a big fireball than an explosion itself. Could it be that the architecture of the downcomer helps here? Maybe when exploding that might push the oxygen to the side and the methane skyward before it fully ignites. Under most conditions, only the liquid methane that has dispersed into the air or oxygen will burn, meaning that this fuel, though rather energy rich, is not as volatile as one might initially expect. But let's consider the absolute worst case with perfect mixture throughout the ignition. Looking at the energy per kilogram as seen before, we can see that methane holds around 13 times as much energy as TNT. The detonation velocity is about 30 30% that of TNT when mixed with oxygen. Completely filled, the stack holds 1,067 tons of methane, and this results in about a 4,300 ton TNT equivalent explosion. Deriving the results from the damage tool here, this will result in certain death and complete destruction within a 350 meter radius. Boca Chica Village, around three kilometers away, would see windows burst and potential damage to buildings as well. Even in Port Isabel at around nine kilometers away, windows might get damaged also. Let's just hope that such an explosion would be very unlikely with this potential blast, but those dams seen here on images provided by RGV aerial photography won't help much in that case. Given what we've learned before about uneven mixture, which will most likely be the case for such an event, the actual explosion itself is probably a factor of 10 times smaller. But we also learned that because of the exponential nature of explosions, this means the damage radius only decreases by a factor of 2.2. In that case, Port Isabel is certainly safe, but pretty sure the tanks would still be gone and serious damage to the pad and the tower are most likely. Repairing and rebuilding all of that could set the testing campaign back by several months. 
Okay, so given all of that, the obvious thing to say here is that we don't want to see an explosion on the ground at all, right? Avoiding the explosion in the first minute of the launch is key here. By then, the rocket will be more than 10 kilometers away from the site and at least two kilometers out over the ocean, having already burned through 300 tons of methane. With an explosion here, debris rain might do some damage, but nothing compared to what would be seen on the pad itself. An explosion here just needs a new rocket, not a complete rebuild of the site, which Elon stated is at least equally as hard to build as the booster or ship. With a loss of the ship, the rockets of course have the advantage because SpaceX already has an assembly line already in place for that with stunning production speed. So what sort of problems could cause a rapid unscheduled disassembly? Let's have a look at this. Here we can see not only the outer ring of engines being close, but the inner ones as well. All nine of these need to move or gimbal to steer the vehicle. Imagine just one of the thrust vector control systems, or TVC for short, failing. In a sudden correction, the engine bell next to it might smash its bell into a blocked engine beside it. We could have leaks of the cooling system, flow separation through deformation of the bells, or particles simply getting flushed into the pumps which might then destroy an engine which leads to a chain reaction with the ignition of the propellant plumbing above. Although the hard start of Starship number 11 problems might be fixed six ways to Sunday, we're looking at 29 engines now instead of just the three. An unwanted vibration or resonance may build up with the full set of Raptors, rupturing propellant pipes or sending particles into the tanks as well, and that could get flushed into the turbines enabling a less likely way of a hard start. Perhaps sudden emergency shutdowns during startup could produce a water hammer effect in the propellant supply. Could that rupture a weakened pipe, having it spill its content and start an intense fire around the plumbing? Keep in mind that 29 engines will feast on a minimum of 16 tonnes of propellant per second. 3.6 tonnes of that will be liquid methane. The biggest N1 explosion was a result of an all-engine shutdown due to a few failures. This of course resulted in the rocket dropping back onto the launch pad. That is something that the Soviets did actually correct by allowing the vehicle to keep the working engines firing so that it can get away from the pad. If the number of engines shut down send the rocket pitching or your in away, it might get rammed like this into the ground with still plenty of fuel to ignite. If it's at least hurled far enough, it might spare the launch site though. Another scenario? Well, with the 20 29 engines burning through 3.6 tons of methane every second, the flame hitting the concrete pad underneath might loosen up more things than expected. If debris gets shot into the engine bay at high speed, things would get messy once again. What if the extremely powerful sound suppression system has issues? Here we see one for the space launch system being tested. Imagine the pressures here. Could any part of it burst and hurl debris into the tanks penetrating them as well, resulting in a leak that is being ignited then by the flames? Perhaps we need to take a close a look at some more of these scenarios in another video, but keep in mind that for the full Starship and booster stack, it'll need to pump over 100 tons of water per second. We're talking about megawatts of installed pump power. Suffice it to say, there are many ways that a launch can fail and only one that it can succeed. That is just a few that we've come up with and I'm sure that SpaceX have come up with many more factors. What do you think though? Where do you see the main risks that might trigger a large explosion during the first minute or so? Did we get some Something wrong regarding the damage potential. Did we over or underestimate fully filled explosions? Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below. And if you've enjoyed this, I'd be grateful if you thought the channel worth subscribing to. I certainly appreciate you all watching here to the end. Thank you to all of the incredible viewers and supporters that help us with what we do. Seriously, we just can't convey how much that means to us and the entire team here. You could be a subscriber, a patron, a YouTube member supporting what we do, or you could be picking up some gear from our merch store, such as this shirt that you see right here. Here. You can pick up that design here in a bunch of colors and product types. The store link is in the description. And hey, if you send me a photo of yourself wearing the gear, I'd love to share it on Twitter. Just use the hashtag MarcusHouseMerch and I should spot it. But yes, no matter how you support what we do, we all love you and appreciate your time. I hope that we've earned that. If you'd like to help us directly with what we do, you can join as a YouTube member via the join button below, or you can become a patron at patreon.com slash MarcusHouse. Either of those options gives you assigned roles to chat with us directly on our Discord server. You can also have your name listed right here like these other amazing people. And you also get earlier and ad-free access to these videos to watch before anyone else. Thanks to my production crew and quality control squad here running over everything as always. If you would also like to keep even more up to date, follow me here on Twitter at Marcus House. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have my video last week. In the top right is my latest video. And in the bottom right, content that YouTube has selected from the channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching and we'll see you all in the next video.